One day, I walk out of here when the song leader didn't really mean for me to. Brother Sam, a while ago, included in part of his prayer, which he led us uh, 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 focus on personal evangelism. And that's a good thing. Mention that uh, publicly from time to, to time in our public prayers. Uh, especially pray about it in, in, in private prayers. Uh, but uh, also, uh, every once in a while, be good in the public prayers as well, I think. To keep this before God and also keeping it before us as we, uh, as we focus on this matter. I, uh, it was brought up to me this morning that I, I might mention, and I, I'm glad that it was, because I, I really wish I'd mentioned it before. Uh, Shane Carrington, he's a gospel preacher down in Sulphur Springs, Texas, and he will be preaching in our gospel meeting here, I believe it's in the spring of 2025. And his wife, uh, Kelly, uh, she has been battling cancer for quite a while now, and, and she's been putting up quite a battle. And, uh, but she has been doing it uh, with a very good spirit. Uh, she's a, a person uh, of great faith. And now uh, it, it, she's at home, and uh, they're expecting her to pass from this earth of any time now. And she continues to have a wonderful attitude. In fact, uh, she has visitors in her home uh, quite regularly now. People really just saying their goodbyes to Kelly. And she mentioned to someone the other day when they visited, she said, uh, I was really kind of hoping that maybe I, I wouldn't wake up today that I would be in the next world. And uh, she wasn't saying that because she just wants to escape the, the, the suffering or the sickness here on this earth. I'm convinced that uh, she wants to depart and be with the Lord, as Paul put it in Philippians chapter 1. He said that's far better. And uh, so she continues to be an inspiration. But the reason I brought that up, uh, continue to pray for her and pray for Shane. Uh, pray for the, the Carrington family. We, we need to be impressed with the truth that's stated in the title of the sermon tonight, God Hates Divorce. And it may be that uh, we, we lose sight of that sometimes because we spend so much time talking about not divorce, but remarriage. That is, who is it that can scripturally remarry versus those who cannot scripturally remarry. It's not my intention tonight to talk to you about remarriage. Now, I, I believe that the Lord stated one cause for divorce and remarriage. He stated it in Matthew 19, 9, and that is, except it be for sexual immorality. But I do not want to focus on the exception. I want to focus tonight on the rule. And the rule is God hates divorce. We have a serious problem. We have a serious problem in our society. And we also have a serious problem in the church today. Marriages are falling apart. And too often they end in divorce. I've been saying for a long time that marriage does not have to end in divorce for it to be a failure. It's a failure when it's not what God wants it to be. And what we should want our marriages to be. <clears throat> marriage is of God. And I believe that that's the starting place in any discussion on divorce. God instituted. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. 
I will make him a helper comfortable to him. So he formed the woman. Verses 21 through 24, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this arrangement, where man leaves his father and mother, so that he may then be joined to his wife, that's God's arrangement. And anything that is of God, we need to treat very, very seriously. Marriage is an institution of God. We need it to treat it that way. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the Hebrew writer said, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. He said marriage is honorable. And we need to think of it as being an honorable institution because it was indeed instituted by God Himself. Now since God instituted marriage, well then He's the one who has the right to tell us how it ought to be in marriage. And God intends for marriage to be for life. People do not take their marriage vows very seriously in our day. In the world in which we live, there are too many what we call trial marriages. That is, we'll get married, we'll give it a try, and if it doesn't work out, we can always get a divorce. That seems to be the mentality in the world. When we were living in, in Tulsa back in the 90s, known into the early 2000s, you could get a divorce kit in Tulsa County for $12.50. Lawyers were not necessary in less complicated divorce cases. So that meant that for $12.50 you could put asunder what God had joined together. But while in the church there are too many trial marriages that is, in the world, there are too many trial marriages. In the church, there are too few problem-solving dispositions. And the mentality of the church a lot of times is, well, if we can't get along, then let's get a divorce and just not get a remarried because everybody knows that the sin is in the remarriage because that's where the adultery occurs, is in the remarriage and so there is no sin in divorce as long as you do not get remarried. Well, is that right? Is that what the Bible teaches? I'm convinced that the Bible teaches very clearly that there is sin in divorce. And so let's look at scriptures now which indicate God's will for marriage. Because to the lover of God, that's what matters, is God's will for marriage. We begin, then, with the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 2, and beginning with verse 13. The Jews had divorced their wives. And so it says in Malachi 2, verse 13, You cover the altar of the Lord with Tears. That would be the tears of the divorced wives. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. 
with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. Now those who think that divorce, divorce for just any reason, is not too bad. As long as you do not remarry, well, they need to reconsider that position. This says clearly, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. And three times in this very brief reading, he mentioned the person who deals treacherously with the wife of his youth. One of those times in verse 14 of Malachi 2, when he said, The Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Well, what does that mean? that he had dealt treacherously with the wife of his youth. It means that he had betrayed a trust. It means that he is a covenant breaker. God, he witnesses the vows, the promises that we make to each other on our wedding day. And we serve a God who expects faithfulness to the vows and the promises that we have made to one another. God hates covenant breaking. God, therefore, hates divorce. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. In the book of Matthew, chapter 19, beginning with verse 3, here we have some of the Jews coming to Jesus with a question, but it was not with a good motive that they asked it. They asked it in order to put him to the test, see how he would answer. And so in Matthew chapter 19, beginning with verse 3, there the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now you will notice that there is nothing in their question about remarriage. I'm not talking about remarriage. Right? The question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And here would have been the perfect opportunity for the Lord to have answered this question by saying yes. Or saying yes for several reasons or yes for two or three reasons. But instead of answering that question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered by saying no. And then he told from the scriptures why a man must not divorce his wife. He said, beginning in verse 4, he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one in flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. So when they asked the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason, he took them back to the beginning. That is, the book of Genesis. The, the word Genesis means beginnings. So you have in the book of Genesis a lot of beginnings. And you have the beginning of marriage. God instituted marriage as recorded there. Now what is it that happened at the beginning? 
That's when God made one man for one woman, one woman for one man for life. And then Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 6, Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. And I think we need to emphasize the God-man distinction. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Or maybe used to the King James Version. Let not man put a son. Now there is a command in verse 6 by the Lord Jesus Christ not to divorce. And it is a command not to divorce whether there is any remarriage or not. The command, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder or separate whether there's any remarriage or not. In fact, remarriage hasn't even been mentioned yet in this passage. Have you noticed that? Because what was the question? It was not about remarriage. The question was about divorce. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And the answer that Jesus gave is no. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, later in this reading, Jesus does mention remarriage. And we'll mention. It. Verses 7 through 9. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? They're making reference here to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. He said, Deuteronomy 24 allowed you for a time. It permitted you for a time to divorce your wives because of hardened and stubborn hearts. Not to encourage the divorce craze, but to curb it, if we go back and study that passage. But what did Jesus do? When they raised this passage, they, 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 talked, they brought up Deuteronomy chapter 24. Jesus took them back before Deuteronomy chapter 24, all the way back to the book of Genesis. And what happened at the beginning? And what was God's original intention? So then in verse 9, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So there he did mention the exception. Except for sexual immorality. But you know, I'm convinced that in this passage that we just read, that's not the emphasis. Now sometimes that's what we emphasize. The remarriage part. And who may scripturally remarry versus those who may not scripturally remarry. And sometimes we do that for good reason. That comes up and we need to talk about it. But I'm saying that here in the context of this passage, that is not the emphasis of Jesus' teaching. The emphasis of Jesus' teaching is there's to be no divorce for any other reason. No divorce for any reason except sexual immorality. And anyone who divorces for some other reason and then marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Why do I say that? Because how did it all begin? With a question. And their question in verse 3, the Pharisees said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Jesus said, No, there's one reason. Other than that reason, he said, 
there is to be no divorce. Now then, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew 5, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus said, Furthermore, it has been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, now he said, here is the law governing my kingdom. He's preaching concerning the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4, verse 23. Here's the law governing his kingdom. Matthew 5, 32. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. <clears throat> there are two men mentioned here in Matthew 5, verse 32. There is the man who divorces his wife for some reason other than sexual immorality. And then there's the man who marries the woman who has been divorced for a reason other than sexual immorality. Two men mentioned in this verse. But I want us to think especially about that first man. The first man that's mentioned in Matthew 5, verse 32. The man who divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality. I want to ask you a question in regard to him. Did that man later remarry? He divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality. Now I want to know. After he did that, did he later remarry or did he live a celibate life? The way I would answer that is it doesn't matter. We don't know. In fact, the Lord didn't, doesn't say whether or not he later remarried. What we need to know is this. He sinned when he got the divorce. When he divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality. And when he sinned, he put her in a vulnerable position. Because when he divorced her, he put her in a, a position where she was, she was vulnerable. She could be weak and, and then be tempted to remarry. And then when she would remarry, then she would be committing adultery. In fact, when this man divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality, he put three souls in jeopardy. Three. First, there's the soul of the woman that he divorced because she will surely be tempted. And Jesus assumes here now that she's tempted and then she remarries. And Jesus said when she remarries, she commits adultery. But then there's a second soul that he put in jeopardy. The soul of the man who married her. Because he stated very clearly in the latter part of verse 32, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. And then the third soul that's in jeopardy, his own. The man who divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality. You can't read that verse without understanding that he is at fault. You can't read that verse without understanding that he has sinned. And then... 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10 beginning. Paul said, Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried. Or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. And here is yet another prohibition against divorce. How many times does the Lord have to say something to make it true? Well, one time. But, you know, you have it in Malachi chapter 2. God hates divorce. Matthew 19, 
what God has joined together, let not man for the sunder. And then you have the, the man mentioned in Matthew 5, 32. He divorced his wife for a reason other than sexual immorality. And now you have yet another prohibition against divorce. The last part of verse 11 says, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. All right, now what's the other side of that? Latter part of verse 10. A wife is not to depart from her husband. So, last part of verse 11, husband's not to divorce his wife. Last part of verse 10, the wife is not to divorce her husband. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Somebody says, how do you know, though, that the word depart indicates divorce? Well, there are a couple of reasons that I would say that. One is because the word translated depart is the same word that's translated in Matthew 19, verse 6, put asunder. And also, or separate in the New King James Version. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder or separate. Now, when we read Matthew 19, 6, we always understand that's talking about divorce. They ask the question, is lawful for man to divorce his wife for any reason? What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The word translated put asunder, that's the same word translated depart. Here's another reason that I say that this is divorce. When a wife departs from her husband, it results in an unmarried state. Last part of verse 10, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Now verse 11, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried. So the action she took in the last part of verse 10 that resulted, according to the first part of verse 11, in her being unmarried. Divorce, that results in an unmarried state. Now, what if she divorces in spite of the command not to do it? And you know, when, Jesus, when, uh, when Paul wrote this, there in all probability were, were those maybe members of the church who had already done it. That is, they had divorced their husbands or divorced their wives without any adultery having been committed. Now, what about them when they had already done it? What about in the future? If someone divorced for a cause other than sexual immorality, then, and did that in spite of this command not to do it, then what? Then there are two options that are left open for her as he mentions the woman here in verse 11. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, if she does divorce, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So he says there are two options left open to her if she divorces in spite of the command of the Lord not to do it. She can remain unmarried for the rest of her life. Or she may be reconciled to her husband. And, and, and then finally we go to the book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans 7, verses 1 through 4. Paul said, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Paul's purpose 
in writing this was not to give them information about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He is not writing in these verses about marriage. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It's not what it's about. He uses it as an illustration of the subject that he is writing to them about. And he is writing to them about their relationship with the law of Moses and the gospel of Christ. And his point is this, that they could not be joined to two systems, that is legitimately, they could not legitimately be joined to two systems simultaneously. The law of Moses and the gospel of Christ any more than a, a woman could legitimately be married to two men at the same time. Now, the illustration that he gives here, marriage, it does say something to us, though, about marriage. As we read it in verse 2. Romans 7, verse 2. <clears throat> For the woman who has a husband, now listen to this, a, the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. That's saying that the husband and the wife, they are joined by God for life. For a whole lifetime. It's not a relationship that can be severed at the whims of men. Well, that, that's, that's all I want to say in terms of the, the passages of Scripture which speak of the till death do us part nature of marriage. But now I do want to begin to finish the sermon by talking about this. God expects us to work on our problems. We know that a lot of times divorce is just not an option. A lot of the time, it is not an option. But God expects us to work on our marriage problems. He expects us to work on our marriage problems like He expects us to work on problems in other relationships, like the parent-child relationship. Can you imagine a parent saying to his 11-year-old child, when there is a conflict between them, well, it's just, it's time to end this right now. It's time to end this relationship. We're going to sever this parent-child relationship, he says to his 11-year-old child. No, doesn't do that. <laughs> doesn't sever the relationship, but the parent says, we got some things to work on. Let's have a talk. We've got some things to work on. Married Christians see the need to work on their problems. To pray about them every day. To seek counsel from God, but also seek counsel from others who, who can help. And to talk to each other calmly and rationally because they're saying, this is our marriage. It's important to us. And we've got to work it out. But working on our problems calls for problem-solving dispositions and the disposition to forgive one another. Not, <coughs> now here's the husband, here's the wife. <coughs> and now there's a problem, a real, really serious problem in their marriage. But the husband and the wife, they're busy attacking each other. They're shooting arrows at one another. But the problem is up here just being ignored. And it's being ignored because they're too busy attacking one another. And what they better learn to do is to redirect the arrows. And instead of pointing those arrows at each other, to work together. To work together as husband and wife. 
as Christians, as people of God who want to please Him above all else. Work on the problem. Point the arrows to the problem. And then what that means is this. Ideally, and I know this is ideally speaking, but ideally, he says, all right, here's my part in this problem. I know I'm at fault, and here's my part in this problem. And then she gladly and willingly forgives him. And she says, well, all right, here's my part in the problem, because I, I know that I've been at fault too. And she says, Here, here's my part. And then he gladly and willingly forgives her. And they have been attacking the problem. And they're saying, all right, now we've got a problem. But we're willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. We are here for the duration because this is our marriage that we're talking about. And our own souls are at stake because this is our marriage. And you know divorce never enters their minds. They don't even think about it. Now, I'm not talking about people out here in the world. I mean, they think about it all the time. And they're following through. And half of marriages in our society are ending in divorce. I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about Christians. For Christians, divorce is the furthest thing from their minds. Because of the scriptures that we've been reading, that we have listed on the screen, Scriptures that have come from God who instituted marriage. And because we believe those scriptures are from God and we serve Him. And we want to please Him. But you know, to please Him, we must work every day to make our marriage what He wants it to be. Shouldn't pleasing God enter into the equation somewhere along the way? In fact, shouldn't that be the first consideration? Pleasing God. We made the promises. And you heard them. He witnessed them. Shouldn't that be top priority? Pleasing God? And that means then that we're just going to have to work on our marriages. And we're going to have to do it every day. Folks, if, if we are not happy in this part of our lives, then we are not happy in any part of our lives. If we're not happy in our homes, then we're going to carry our problems to work. If we're not happy in our homes, we're going to carry our problems to the church building, the worship services. It's kind of hard to muster up a whole lot of zeal and enthusiasm for the Lord. It's kind of hard to really focus on worship, honoring Him and pleasing God in our worship when we're fussing and fighting at home all the time. Isn't it worth it to work on our relationships? It begins by becoming a Christian as we extend the invitation tonight. And then once we have become Christians, followers of the Lord, then we're going to follow, we're going to respect the Lord's blueprint for every area of our lives. We're going to recognize that, that blueprint for marriage, it is there. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Peter chapter 3, passage after passage after passage, which gives us the blueprint, the blueprint that came from God to have successful marriages. It begins by becoming a Christian. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ, to put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. And if you'll make that commitment tonight, that will be the most important commitment that you've ever made in your life. And that means even if you already made the commitment to a marriage partner, if you're married, and you made a commitment recently or many years ago, you made a commitment to your marriage partner. 
still the most important commitment that you'll ever make will be the one you've made tonight if you make that decision tonight. And we encourage you to do that right now, Lord. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus.